Okay, so let's start out with kind of a 10,000 foot overview of this guy, and then we'll kind of drill down on some details, and then do some cooking. I unboxed this pot in a video a couple of months ago, and I got to say, first impression, right out of the box, a fantastic presentation. You pull this thing out, and it's just ornate and beautiful, and you almost wonder, is it so fancy, am I even going to be able to cook in this thing? So very, very beautiful pan. Um, it's got this acorn design in the handle, and it's a brass handle, three rivets on that guy. And the rivets seem to be maybe stainless steel or some sort of steel. They're not brass rivets. Um, hand hammered. Ruffoni makes these in Italy near the Italian Alps. And you see all these little indentations. That is hand hammered. And then it's lined with tin. Now, if you know a little bit about copper cookware, you know that copper is a reactive metal. And as such, for most everyday cooking, copper cookware comes lined with a secondary metal so that your food never actually touches the actual copper. Copper can leach into the food, and if you get too much of that in you, that can be dangerous. Uh, for most consumer um, copper cookware these days, it's often lined with stainless steel. For example, this is a Falk. And this is a Moviel, and these are both stainless steel lined. The Ruffoni has the more traditional tin lining. Now tin, there are some advantages and disadvantages to it. You gotta be careful with it. If you were to, for example, preheat a copper pan on a gas stove top, empty, dry, with no liquid or fat or food in it, you could actually damage the tin in as little as 30 to 45 seconds. Now, the tin could start to melt at 420 to 450 degrees Fahrenheit, but thankfully, we are mostly going to be around the boiling point of water with this guy, and that's going to keep us out of trouble. Okay, some quick stats and features on this guy. It's a 16-inch pan, tip to tail, about five and a half inches deep, so pretty deep pan, and you notice the shape, kind of conical, actually kind of flares out more towards the top. Nine inches from rim to rim at the top and six inches on the bottom. Uh, the handle has been very sturdy. It does get hot when you cook, especially on a gas stove made out of brass. And if I were to nitpick just a little bit, I would like to see just a little bit thicker handle on here. It just looks a little thin based on the size of the pot but I have had no trouble with it and it seems to be very sturdily attached. So right at about three pounds for this guy, so pretty sturdy, not overly heavy. When you pick it up, it feels just a skosh thinner than the uh, Moviel or the Falk. I think those guys are a little bit thicker, but those are for different purposes. And this is part of Ruffoni's Historia collection, and they mentioned that it works best on a gas cooktop. You could also use it on an electric, but unfortunately, if you have induction, you are out of luck there because copper cookware does not work on induction cooktops. And in this video, I'm going to be throwing out some opinions, and they are my own. I always point out for products I review, I buy with my own money. With this one, there's a little bit of a twist. My wife actually bought this pan for me for our 10 year wedding anniversary. Now, I will point out that my wife and I don't argue about much, but we do squabble from time to time over all the cookware I have around here. Where are we going to put it? She thinks I have too much, but then when it comes time to give a gift, she bought me cookware. And then we argue about where to stick it. And I don't want to psychoanalyze that too deeply, scared of what that might reveal. But if there is such thing as an inverse virtuous circle, I think I have achieved it. And as far as cost, I believe this cost roughly $250 or so. And this particular model, I believe, is only available at Williams Sonoma. And it comes with this little guy, too, which is kind of a nice touch. A little wooden um, polenta spatula included in the kit. At a high level, what is polenta and is it the exact same thing as grits? Um, I grew up in Alabama. I have eaten a ton of grits. And as a matter of fact, I had them for breakfast this morning. Are they the same thing as polenta? Now, polenta is uh, traditionally an Italian dish from the northern region of Italy. And I guess back in the day, 
It was made with different grains, but after corn was introduced from the New World, it has traditionally been made with corn. Uh, polenta and grits are both ground up dried corn. And without trying to start um, an inane internet debate, polenta and grits are pretty darn near the exact same thing. On some packaging, you will see a package that says polenta corn grits. Other times there are nuances, but they are almost the exact same thing. This poses for me a little bit of a philosophical food dilemma. After all, Shakespeare once said, a rose by any other name would still smell just as sweet. Uh, grits, kind of a harsh guttural type word, grits. Polenta is often described as a corn porridge, corn porridge. Well, la ti da But doesn't it sound so much nicer and more delicious and more hearty, almost like something out of a Dickens novel, to have corn porridge versus grits? And no offense to anyone else in Alabama, but I thought I was moving up just a little bit in life when I realized I could have been eating corn porridge all these years and I had been eating grits. Made me feel like a little bit of an Alabama hick. Polenta also typically not a main, it's usually a side dish. One of the dishes it is traditionally a side dish for, that's a mouthful, is popozo. This Rufoni polenta pot inspired me to make popozo three or four times this month just for an excuse to use the polenta pot and make some polenta. So for the first cooking test, let's make some popozo first, then we'll make some basic polenta to go along with it, and then go from there. Now I'll do a full video on some popozo at some point, but in a nutshell, it's an Italian peppered beef dish. You take a cut of meat, like a chuck roast, something with some marbling, some connective tissue, and you cube that up and get some salt on there. Very important, uh, lots of pepper. And I got out the old mortar and pestle, kind of trying to do the real deal version here. And you take some olive oil and brown that beef in the olive oil, you get some garlic in there, and you add a bunch of Chianti red wine, and you slow cook that in a heavy dish, like a Dutch oven. Uh, I cooked mine in the oven for about three hours, three and a half hours at 325, and it turns out absolutely fantastically. And it's traditionally served with, or actually usually on top of, polenta. So let's get that basic polenta going. Um, I'm adding water to the pot first. I'm not preheating the pot or even turning the burner on before I have the water in there because I want to be very careful with that tin. And while that water is coming up to boil, I measure out my polenta. And a little trick here, you don't want to add salt to uh, cold water in a pan before it's warm. You can get some pitting, you could damage the uh, surface of your cookware. So what I like to do is just add the salt to the dry polenta. And when the water is up to a boil, I stir that in. Now I'm using a coated whisk here. The directions from Rufoni say that you are not supposed to use metal utensils in a tin line copper pot like this. You could damage the surface. So I am only using either the wood traditional spatula that came with the pan or pot and, um, and coated or silicone uh, other utensils. So this is a coated whisk. And when you add anything like polenta or grits to hot water, what you wanna do is make sure you are whisking and stirring those vigorously so that you don't get any clumps or lumps in your polenta. And in the proverbial overabundance of caution, what I am doing as this polenta cooks is taking my um, Thermaworks surface probe thermometer and kind of checking and taking some readings around the pan, just making sure that it's not overheating anywhere on the pan. And in a couple of places, it might've gotten up a little over 300 degrees up the sides of the pan, but nowhere near that 420 to 450 range. Uh, we're boiling water here, and that's gonna keep things relatively well regulated. And for a basic polenta, which serves as a foundation for some delicious piposo, I think we are off and cooking here, and the Rufoni is doing a great job. Next up, let's try some grits or corn porridge. And same basic procedure here. I'm using the five minute quick grits here. And once they've gone about five minutes, then I add some cheddar cheese. And what I wanna show here is that this Rufoni does not come with a lid. 
Uh, traditionally, when you cook grits, you cook them covered. Uh, these, because they are kind of the five minute quick grits, gonna cook these uncovered and it's no big deal. On the weekends, if we're cooking more of the traditional grits that take 15, 20 minutes or longer to cook, those typically are cooked covered. And the simple solution there is for the longer cooking items, you want to just monitor your liquid level and if they start looking a little dry, add more water. Second point here with the grits. Normally I would cook grits in a stainless steel saucepan. And if you've ever cooked grits in a stainless steel saucepan, you know that when it comes time to clean up, you have to soak the pan because the grits really fuse to that stainless steel. I found that with the Rufoni, with that tin lining, it was much easier to clean up. I thought the grits released um, significantly better with the tin lining versus the stainless steel. Now let's cook a little fancier polenta. Here I'm using some Bob's Red Mill polenta and they have several recipes on the back. They've got the basic, They've got a cheesy, they've got a, a Parmesan, and they've got a creamy recipe. What I'm doing here is combining the creamy polenta recipe and the uh, Parmesan cheesy recipe, and I'm also going to add some butter. We've got two cups of water, two cups of milk. That's where some of the creaminess comes from. I'm also adding some butter, a good couple of tablespoons of butter in there. Bring that liquid and butter up to a boil. Whisk in my polenta. And here I'm cooking this one about 20 minutes and I'm stirring about once a minute, if not more often, so I'm on it. And then I'm stirring in a cup of grated Parmesan cheese. And again, I am serving this underneath yet another batch of Popozo. I thought the cheese flavor was really bold in this. And one way to look at polenta is it's kind of a base to which you can add other ingredients. When I made the breakfast grits, I used cheddar cheese and much more of a breakfast oriented flavor there. With this polenta, I added Parmesan cheese and I thought that gave it a little bit of an Italian type bent there and it went really well with more Popozo. And for the grand finale cooking test, I wanna make some Farinata Al Cavolo Nero a leveled up polenta dish, which we're gonna serve with some more Popozo. And I got the recipe, the base recipe from this book, one of my favorite cookbooks, La Cucina Toscana. It's uh, actually in Italian, I bought that in Italy. But if you have Google Translate, you can do a pretty good job if you don't read any Italian. But fantastic recipes in that book. And this is a polenta dish that's gonna start out with a sofrito. And then we're gonna add some uh, white cannellini beans and some black kale. Don't fear the kale. Cavolo nero means black kale in Italian, black cabbage. And what I've got here is a sofrito and I'm gonna start out by putting the oil and the onion into the Raffoni polenta pot before I turn the flame on because we're cooking in tin. I don't want to preheat this here. Let the onion cook for a couple minutes, then I get my celery and carrot in there. Let everything soften up. In the meantime, I have washed a bunch of black kale. And if you've ever used black kale, you know there is a very thick rib down the middle of the kale. Now you can cut that rib out, or what I like to do, just for the heck of it, it's a little more rustic, I think, is tear the kale off of that rib and get rid of that rib. You would not want anything like this in your bowl of polenta. And after my sofrito is softened up just a little bit, I'm going to add that kale, and let that wilt down a little bit. I'm also going to add some white Italian kidney beans, cannellini beans. Bonus points here if you started out with dried beans as I did, so I've had these cooking for a couple of hours. In go my beans. I'm gonna get my water in for my polenta, and I've heated this water up a little bit. I don't like adding cold water to anything that's cooking. It stops the cooking, and I don't want to shock the pan, so I've heated my water. Also, in goes my polenta. Stir that. And 
absolutely fantastic. Farinata al cavolo nero. Um, I really do like the colors of this dish. You've got the yellow of the polenta with a few little orange chunks from the carrots. You get the green from the kale. Get the, the proposal on top of there. And then I reserved a few of the white beans to add as a garnish on top and a little something green. And absolutely delicious. The Ruffoni did a fantastic job at making this Farinata al cavolo nero. Leveled up polenta. Now let's talk a little bit about patina and whether you want to keep your copper shiny or not. Typically, I don't polish my copper and I let it develop a patina. And this pan is several years old. I don't think it's ever been polished. And I like the kind of rustic look. It looks like the one on the front of the Italian cookbook. However, this Ruffoni is so shiny and beautiful and nice. I'm gonna make an exception for this one. And I am keeping this one shined and polished. So let me show you how that works. Here's what it looked like after cooking in it a month or two. So I've got a little bit of patina developing there. I just used some, I believe it's Copper Brill by Moviel. There are a bunch of different copper polishes. And went all around the bottom of that pan. and it shined right up. So it's a matter of personal preference. Do you go rustic and not worry about it? If you go shiny, it's really not that much maintenance, uh, just a couple of minutes, but you gotta stay on it. Now at the top of the video, we posed three questions. The first question, is the Ruffoni a high quality piece of cookware? This is my first piece of Ruffoni and I am impressed with it. I really do like it. Um, it's beautiful and it's functional and I think it is a high quality piece. I like the hand hammered indentations. I like the ornate decorative nature of the handle. I'm not sure I would equip an entire kitchen with stuff like this, but I do like having one piece and I'm going to display this proudly in my kitchen. Um, it's sturdy. I wish the handle were just a little bit bigger, but that's kind of a First world uh, nitpick. Second question, does it produce delicious food? Absolutely, with the uh, polenta we made, with the grits, with the farinata al cavolo nero, produce some absolutely delicious food, and especially good food, uh, good polenta side dishes with other fancier dishes like that proposo. Now the third question was, do you need a fancy Italian polenta pot in your kitchen? The answer here is absolutely not, you do not need a pan like this. However, you may want a pan like this, and that's where I think the Ruffoni comes in. When it comes to functionality, that Ruffoni is not going to be a daily driver. Um, this is my trusty three-quart stainless steel Cuisinart that has been producing grits and polenta for decades now, and it does a fine job. However, Look at this guy, look how beautiful it is. I like dedicated cookware. This pot has a singular purpose. I don't need it, but boy, I sure do like having it. And I want to add here that to the extent cookware can be inspirational, I find this Ruffoni polenta pot to be inspirational. After all, if I just had the old three quart Cuisinart sitting around, there is no way I would have made Paposo three times this month and learned Farinata al Cavolo Nero. I did that because I had a fancy new Ruffoni polenta pot. And that inspired me to do some real deal cooking. So it's beautiful, it's functional, it produces a lot of good food. I'm going to proudly display this in my kitchen. And I would not hesitate to get another piece of Ruffoni. So the Ruffoni Italian made tin line copper polenta pot gets a thumbs up. You probably don't need it, but boy, it sure would be nice to have. Now, let me know what you guys think in the comments section below. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you again next time on Uncle Scott's Kitchen.